Welcome back, Design Squad. In this video, I have a special guest, and it's Sean McGuire, one of the fellow design thinkers who have been following for quite some time. We connected on LinkedIn, and purely because Sean shares a lot of different things online, and I value your transparency because you're writing a book on design thinking moderation and you're sharing chapter by chapter, which is you know it's amazing because people like myself let's say even if i'm experienced in the field i can upskill myself but I also share it with my junior designers or general design community and one of the bits why i wanted to talk to you and and you know for quite some time was the billboard design thinking because that's something new to me you know that that immediately caught my eye yeah thanks for inviting me and uh, also for this opportunity kind of to share my thoughts about billboard design thinking and one of the things I'm often asked is why I like to share my stuff because maybe I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. Or often moderators figure out a specific way how to run workshops and they say it's great now I can monetize on it. But in the end, I think we have so many crappy projects in the world that we just need more people that can run better uh, workshops. Mm -hmm. So even if a thousand people copy my ideas, I was, they won't be out of work, so why not just share it? And could you could you kind of give a bit of uh, you know overview of how you how did you get to this point? How did you get to being a design thinking moderator, UX architect at Microsoft, running workshops? Yeah, I think my story is kind of it started when I was very young. I used to be a game inventor, and I sold a few games to Ravensburger and Parker Brothers when I was young, 18, 16, 18 years old. Like physical games? Or? Yeah, so these old-fashioned games where we still have boards with dices and things like that. But the interesting thing was people don't want to read instructions. So they open the box, take out the game board, put on the figures and start playing. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true for interfaces. So people just open an interface and start clicking around. Yeah, nothing can happen. So many years, like almost 30 years later, it kind of tied back uh, to my profession. In my background is also I have 15 years as an industry designer. In the combination basically learning from what you do as a game inventor over industry designer, then going into UX just gave me kind of this rich background. And what I was always interested in having good products. And I always say I'm told to work on failing projects. It's just no fun. I have no time for that. That's what really drives me. Like when I first discovered you, it was the billboard design thinking what you know caught my eye like so what's the difference between billboard design thinking and regular design thinking i think the, i think there's something very counterintuitive about the billboard design thinking and the thing that uh, most people kind of are really suspicious about is if you're super innovative how can you actually craft a complete experience because the billboard idea is that you craft a human conversation star trend for complete day. Like, mm -hmm. we start here, this is the first task, then we do this task, this task, and this task. And they always ask me, well, how do you know that this is the next thing you need? Because the idea mm -hmm. is, if you're innovative, you just have a room, you have an open idea, open question, now we're super creative. But I'm convinced that when you have a workshop, the workshop owner always has a desire for a very specific result. Mm -hmm. like a project plan or the five best ideas or a user story <clears throat> or a interface design, whatever it is. And the way I design my workshops, it was from the back to the front. So first look, what do you actually want? Mm -hmm. It's like an architect. You want a house? Okay. What do you want? You want a cottage. Okay, now then he starts thinking, not the other way around. And if you go from the back to the front, the question is always, what activities do I have in my workshop that are going to give me something that's going to help me answer the question at the end of the day? And by kind of thinking this is like a funnel, here are all my different activities. They all contribute with specific information in order to answer the question in the back. That's the way you can go. Then you can construct your workshop from the beginning to the end, or actually from the end to the beginning, in a very rigid manner. And here the benefit is because it's very structured, uh, you just save a lot of time. And the second thing is, because you have a very a detailed plan on the beginning, if something goes wrong, you're going to learn very fast. Like, mm -hmm. don't ever do that again. 
Mm -hmm. and, and this is a good segue because I collected a few comments from my YouTube subscribers and they gave very specific questions for you. But one comes from Camille and he's asking how to collect data information you need should know before you start working on a workshop. And he's saying that either it is a new project or a new phase of a project, how to be sure that you will cover as much as you can in your questions during the workshop. Well, the way I see it, every workshop has a workshop owner. The workshop owner who is in the end the person who's going to be paying for your workshop. And I want to connect with that person. And the mm -hmm. only thing I need to understand is what do you want in the end of the workshop? What's the result you want to have? And before I have the workshop, I'll design the workshop, I'll draw the billboard and then have a conversation. So it might be a personal meeting or a team's call. Where I'm going to show him uh, the whole process and say, here we're going to start. These are the activities and when we finish this is what I'm going to deliver. So I'm going to walk him through the complete workshop before the workshop actually happens. <clears throat> and then I get the assessment. Yes, that's cool. This is what I want. Or no, I don't. Which means go back to the drawing board, mm. make a new billboard, give him a second call and ask, is this what you want to have? What if, so let's say when I tend to run workshops and, and to be honest, just a few weeks back, I got this question from actual owner, like pro, what they call product champion, someone mm. who, who is there to sponsor the actual deliverable of UX. They're saying, how are you sure that this is what you're doing is the right thing? Well, for me, it's uh, like I have templates. So one of the mm. templates is like a uh, to-do list project plan. And ask the workshop owner, uh, imagine if we have the complete workshop and what we come out is with a project plan, with a KPI project sponsor, to-do task and blockers. Mm -hmm. Would that satisfy you? And if he says yes, well, that's what I'm going to deliver. Or if I ask him, we have a sketching session and we have a... Uh, build a complete user story, uh, user journey, and we have maybe some uh, interface sketches and we can tell the story how the person is going to interact with your product. Are you going to mm -hmm. be happy? And I usually show them like examples from previous workshops so they have an idea what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that they say afterwards, well, I expected something completely else. Mm -hmm. While if it's like we're going to have an innovation workshop, sorry, I can't tell you what we're going to get, but we're going to be super creative. And here you have three ideas and then he says, well, sorry, it's not what I wanted. Yeah, it's, mm. I think the risk is much less if you actually pinpoint in the beginning, that's what you're going to get. Mm. You just tell me now, do you want it? Yes or no. So kind of agreeing on su success criteria and then proceeding. It's, it's for me a contract. The contract yeah. is a promise. I'm doing this workshop and also this is an investment from your side. Mm -hmm. And in many workshops, people only think about their investments or what does it cost for the consultant to come. But a company with 10 or 15 people from top or medium management sitting in the workshop, that's a huge investment. So there's no workshop that only costs 5K. It does not happen. 10 people in one room for one full day with travel costs or something like that, mm -hmm. you already spent 15, 20,000 from the company side. In whatever you deliver, must match that investment of the internal investment as well as what they're paying for you to come and do the workshop. Mm -hmm. And how do you extract the findings? And I'm coming from another question actually, mm -hmm. and it was almost how do you take the design thinking and bring it into agile? Because yeah. to me, a lot of pushback I get is, um, oh, if we do design thinking workshops, it almost creates a blank space before you can actually do agile. And, you know, it's not as agile, basically. It, it almost forces a waterfall. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, I think that's one of the things that uh, I've experienced. Many people are turned off by design thinking workshops. So you have all of this momentum. Everyone's excited. We have these great ideas. And then it's like, what's happening next? And it's very hard to have this transition from here's this great experience you have to where's my product. And the transition for me is the documentation. So in all the trainings, I always tell people, if your workshop has no documentation, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And if you want to figure out if you have a good moderator, just ask him and show me your documentation. And if the only thing you get back is like a PowerPoint slide with a few people standing in front of the posters <laughs> doing this kind, ask back your money. Yeah. yeah. And 
if you have a rigid documentation and documentation means for me every post it has a value because behind every post this is an idea but the one big problem is on the post that people will just say like uh, improve organizational speed so what does that mean nothing right? the interesting thing is always the conversation around the artifact that you so someone comes and says increase organizational speed and in the workshop, I will be asking the person, what do you mean with that? And he's going to mm -hmm. tell a story. I'll document this story. I'll just type it into my computer. And that's the interesting thing. When you have all of this information, it's like each post-it is almost like a requirement. So the way mm -hmm. I do my documentation is, if you have 200 post-its, well, you're going to have 200 individual statements. Here's the post-it. This is what mm -hmm. the person said. And next to that, I will have a column. Is it in scope? Yes, no. Is it relevant for the project? Yes or no. So when I hand it over to the team, they can actually go through all of that mm -hmm. and tick box, do I want to have it or not? So I actually, my goal is to, uh, to make a transition from everything that happened into a workshop to each statement is a potential requirement and hand it over to the development team to look through all of that mm -hmm. with the project or product owner and make a decision, is it important or not. Mm -hmm. and, and then you would potentially, other designers or product designers would explore further, right? Of how to add that. Yes, or, it depends on the size of the project. Yeah. So if it's a small project, then I'll go into the next step. I also do some prototyping or even do some specification. Mm -hmm. For me in the end, if it's, and not all of the projects are so, but if it's a project where you're gonna have a UI, mm -hmm. I'll build a prototype. And then for me, the important thing is I want to have a specification where I get end users in the room. So mm -hmm. I don't want the managers in the room. I want the end users that then go through the prototype and confirm this is what we want to have. Mm -hmm. That's my ultimate goal. And if that's okay, then I would hand it over to the product team. And uh, in a perfect situation, I'll spend the day with the product team and explain them this was the workshop. Here is the prototype, and then we're going to uh, walk through all the use cases. Did you understand? Do you have some comments? Mm -hmm. And then maybe also important for me is, I don't think one single person is the smartest in the universe. That means it's like always a suggestion. So if I make a prototype, I hand it over to the team. Like this is the minimum standard. Mm -hmm. That's what I came up with. But if you can improve it, please do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before you do it, just have a conversation with me. Mm -hmm. For example, so you are part of very large organization, yeah. and Microsoft is really progressive with their design. I'm part of big organization as well, and I think some of the viewers and myself included, I would be interested to know if you ever have to convince someone that design thinking is the right approach for them. Or every if day, you, if you I have to do that every day. Okay. Yeah, because even in a large organization, it's like. The problem with design thinking is I think many people have really bad experience with design thinking. Like I once had a customer and I explained, let's have design thinking. He said, why? He said, because it's going to help your project. Well, said, you know, the last time I had a guy coming doing a design thinking workshop, we built like spaghetti towers. <laughs> I mean, I didn't get the point. So, yeah. and, and maybe that's why my passion for, for teaching people moderation is Every bad workshop is basically like ruining like, uh, the benefit of design thinking. You have a top manager who has been in one workshop and what he's going to say is, forget about it. This is just a waste of time. And you mm -hmm. can come back many, many times. It takes you a lot of convincing to have this person being interested in design thinking because for him it's just, yeah, it's posted and then we had fun and we had a picture, but there was no result. And you've been also traveling across the world, right? Like yes. running different design thinkings. Is there any differences or anything you, you saw different across the globe? No, well, that was one of the interesting things. I had some workshops in Saudi Arabia and that was also like a question. It's a completely different culture. Is there any difference? Ultimately, I think no. Because I think behind all of the cultures, you know, I had workshops in India and Australia and also in Colombia. And the thing that unifies people is just much more than the differences. And in the end, people are all curious. They want to share ideas. Everyone enjoys building stuff. Yeah, um, Like we have a project that's built something new. 
this excitement, this, this joy of uh, solving a problem is much bigger than any cultural difference. Yes, there are some slight differences, but I don't think they're like huge. Do you find language to be a barrier at all? It can be a uh, barrier. So I had workshops in Sweden, but you just, that's part of the investigation you have to do up front. And you also have to be sensitive about it. Like you have a workshop and 20 people are speaking Swedish and they all try to speak English and you kind of mm. have to realize the only reason why they're speaking English because you don't speak Swedish. Um, but you can always find a mixture. Like, for example, you can have a conversation. So the group has a conversation in Swedish. But please, when you finish, just share your information in English. Yeah, that's okay. And also sometimes people, they understand the language, but they're not keen to speak because they just don't feel well. Or well, have someone translate it. Or even we had like, uh, we had like Swedish consultants here. We said, if you don't want to speak English, just speak in, in Swedish, no problem. And we're going to have this person translate it mm -hmm. afterwards. Hmm. Interesting. But how do you, on, on a, like almost like a slightly different note, how do you drive a room? How do you keep up the momentum? Because that's kind of like my personal, you know, it's challenging. It's because you also need to maintain your own personal energy levels. Mm -hmm. Because design thinking could, workshops could last throughout a week if mm -hmm. you have stakeholders who have only maybe half an hour a day mm -hmm. maybe you can't even do it in one day so you spread it and then it becomes like a, like a marathon of, of sprints i guess that's the basic idea behind the billboard the billboard is the visualization of what you have done so if you have workshops that go over several days and maybe you have different actors now it's like people are totally disoriented now if you have this huge poster on the wall and sometimes mm -hmm. like i had a workshop where you had like four posters, each five meters, meaning 20 meters. So on the first day, it's like, yay, we finished like the first poster. The second day, the people come in, what are you doing? Or well, you just walk and through, this is what we did on the first day. And mm -hmm. my expectation is after the day, we're going to be finished here. Mm -hmm. But you can cut it off at any point. And when people come back, you can just focus them and say, this is what we've done. It's like building a house and you mm -hmm. have four walls and now... We have to work on this wall and so very obviously because it's this is the empty part of the poster and that's the way it drives the people in a normal one day workshop it's like uh, we need to be finished at 4 30 because people are going to the airport or bringing the children to school mm -hmm. and that's always my driving argument so if people start having some kind of internal discussion <laughs> sorry guys yeah. and girls and ladies uh we need to finish that and there's only mm -hmm. one way Nice discussion, but let's go on to the next point. And actually, never anyone will reject it after just saying, mm -hmm. okay, I dropped that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think that's a very interesting bit because the billboard method was like, wow, you can actually do this. Because what you do is really just almost make a scroll of activities. And that you almost use it as a tool to guide the sessions, right? Yes. Because like myself, even right now, I'm still using... Um, template by template mm. so I can make it modular yeah. but so do you use uh, like the same billboard the same template for each of the workshops or do you update it somehow do you use it like modular activities or what's your so approach? every workshop is specifically designed for customer it never mm. happens you have two uh, two workshops of the same and the two things that are important for me is the post itself is actually like a gift which sounds a little bit crazy, but let's say you invite me to your house, mm -hmm. bring a bottle of wine or bring a, a, a bunch of flowers for, for your wife. Basically, what it shows is that you appreciate the customer because you at least went to his website to kind of check what are like the standard colors. And that's important. So when you come in, like I always have a picture in the beginning. Yeah? It's like this person actually took time to look what's important for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. If you have a workshop for an oil company, let's say for Shell, well, I'll just go on the website, just look what is the vision statement mm -hmm. and put it up front. Yeah? And, and that kind of, it, what, it, what that brings is people just understand you care about them. And if workshops go wrong, they usually go wrong within the first 15 minutes. Because if they see you have a plan, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, let's give them a chance. And then the people start, and when they see results, people are all result-orientated. 
like I blocked my complete day. I had to move my meetings. I mm-hmm. had to find someone to take care of my child. So I want to have a benefit of the workshop, but that after 50 minutes, I kind of realized, hey, this brings value. Mm-hmm. What then you're going to listen for the entire day. Mm-hmm. And if you, you go a little bit back to that 15 minutes, what could go wrong? Yes. What usually goes wrong? It's a misalignment with the with the workshop owner, like that maybe he had an idea. This is what we want to work on, mm-hmm. and the complete group will decide. Uh, that brings no value. Why are we doing it? In the end, I can't force 10, 15, or 20 strangers that don't know me. It's like we don't know why this guy is here, what he wants from us. Yeah. And so, with the workshop owner, basically has to have this firm, resolute statement. We are all in the room to do or mm-hmm. to complete this this job mm-hmm. and this is a good segue again to one of the questions about figures of authority or you know let's say an owner of a workshop product champion whatever you would call it and and dealing with them for example myself i dealt a lot with people who sh- who don't want to be there or mm-hmm. owners who who are doing that because someone else told them to do mm-hmm. that do you have any tips of how to approach that you mean someone that is ordered to go to the workshop because he got an email from a uh, superior that just said, I expect you to go and... Most likely. And he's like, <laughs> I have so much to do. I have like 100,000 emails and now yeah, I need to waste my case. complete day there. Yeah. So uh, one thing I in general do is if I see there's resistance, I always openly talk about it. So if I come in a room and I just have the feeling no one wants to be here, yeah, then I'll just have a short conversation about it. For me, it's always important. I'm never going to force anyone to do something in a workshop he does not want to do. Mm-hmm. For example, if someone I ask people to sketch and someone does not want to sketch, I'm never going to force them to say, okay, it's no problem. Just write it down. Maybe mm-hmm. You don't want to draw. And the same is in general proof for a workshop. You can't force people to do things. You need to account things. So if you don't have any consents, uh, you need to ask people. Mm-hmm. And I think this is also kind of a trick with the poster because people are super curious. Usually when they come in the room, it's like, okay, why is this poster hanging here? So this is already your first kind of uh, engagement point. Mm-hmm. They ask questions. Yeah? Then in all of my workshop, I have name cards. So usually like the first, either they're empty on the table. So when the people trickle in, I just come and say, yeah, hello, my name is Sean. Could you please put your name here on the name card? And I have mine where it's already shown. It's like you already kind of established the way you're going to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare that people are kind of hostile. It's like um, this person put so much time into actually prepare it, so he probably has, it, has a plan. And I think what people really resist is meetings with no agenda. Just come here, spend your time and solve a problem. If you tell the people why you're here, then almost everybody is ready to do it. And that's true for almost everything in life. Like, please come to to the school. Why? Well, because we have a problem with your child. Well, I'll go. Mm. But if you just get the notice, please come to school. Why? This is always the question. If you can give people a good reason, and I think that's, and this is why I call it billboard, because I think the post itself is a promotion for many, many things. First of mm. all, it's a promotion when you come in the workshop. But then the second thing is we have so many innovation workshops where there's no results. We have great hackathons. We had fantastic ideas. Mm-hmm. Then you investigate a half a year later, what happened? Nothing. Why? You had these fantastic ideas, nothing came out. Well, because they can't sell their idea. And the idea from the poster is that you're combining two things, advertising and design thinking at the same time. The visuals on the poster comes from design thinking. This is my Mm -hmm. method, it's emphasis map, it's a stakeholder map, whatever it is. But the result that you have is this huge poster. And this is nothing as advertising. I often have workshops where like you're finished and the poster is there and someone pops his head into the room. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. We have a workshop. Okay, this looks interesting. So you're in the selling mode. And I think that's, that's a kind of a trick. And so when people are resist then it's only because they say i'm here and i don't know what you're expecting Mm -hmm. by framing this i think it just reduces the chances of uh, people being very reserved about you having this moderation of the workshop from the beginning on
Mm -hmm. And on a technical level, do you send any agenda beforehand? Like, what's your approach on you know setting up the scene before it even happens? Yeah. So what I like to do is, if I'm asked to do that, I'll send them uh, just a picture from a workshop. So for the expectations. Otherwise, they all come with the laptops. And the first thing, sorry, you don't need a laptop, so yeah. I'll tell them interactive, but I won't tell them all the details, how it's going to run. And then the most important thing is I always write down, uh, good news is you don't need to prepare anything, just come in time. Mm -hmm. Because some facilitate to say, let's hand out uh, work up front to go and read it. And the bad thing that I think about it, first of all, is it's really hard today in, in Today, the way we work today to have a complete day off and uh, move all their meetings and all their appointments so you don't want to give them an extra task. And what I've seen in some of the workshops, like you give them, please read this article or go and look at this video, mm -hmm. that probably 70-80% will not do it. And I would say more than that. Or even more. <laughs> but what happens with this poor guy that or, or, or girl that actually did it, it's like you get these remarks, well, no surprise, because he's not stressed. I, I'm, I'm not surprised he has two hours to read this article. Yeah, So you're creating a discord in the beginning of the workshop. You don't want it. So just have the people come and they're relaxed and start the workshop and don't add anything mm -hmm. additional for them up front. And how do you take it afterwards, let's say, if, if we would, you know, about peripherals of actual workshop, do you send out the documentation to everyone like what's your usually approach because you you said before about prototyping yeah. if you need to yeah. uh, informing your development teams but how do you communicate with the team which you just leave off you know what happened in a workshop let's say well i think it's also always a part of the workshop at the end of closing the workshop is to tell the people what the next thing is because what people want to know like okay, we had these great ideas. Let's say in the workshop you make a project plan and what I like to do is, for example, say, what are you going to do in the next 30, 60, 90 days? So I always try to drive people to actually do something. And then it's important for the people that they can check out. Like, okay, I participated in the workshop and no one's asking anything from me. Or I participated in the workshop, but because I'm the data administrator, the thing we need to do in the next step is have a conversation to map your database and we're going to be contacted by somebody. It's important that people can just understand, is it done, done? Mm -hmm. But also I think there should always be a communication, but that's a decision from the workshop owner to tell them like, okay, we're going to have a core team, we're going to evaluate this, we're going to go to management, we're going to pitch the solution, and this might be March 1st and you're going to get an answer from that. People mm -hmm. want to know in the end of the day, I invested my time, is there anything else I need to do? But also they want to ultimately have the answer. Mm -hmm. So if you have the workshop and you never hear something, and after six months you meet someone, hey, Joe, we had this workshop, did something happen? I don't know. That's really bad. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the responsibility is always to the workshop owner. And I also don't believe in sending stuff out to anyone. So for me, there should always be a central point. So do the, com the documentation, hand it over to the workshop owner. He also has the responsibility to actually look into it, mm -hmm. if that's okay. And if he wants, he can distribute it with whoever he thinks uh, is the correct recipient of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this information could be confidential, what's inside. Maybe it could be controversial. Maybe people talking about reforming the organization. He always has the last veto. I will never send anything directly to any of the participants. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a case where you discovered something which totally transformed the actual development of a service or a product? So the worst case was like, or actually it was no, not a worst case, but the understanding in a workshop that what they wanted to build makes no sense yeah? because they were keen it was like technology driven we have this mm -hmm. great idea we want to implement this technology and what we had is um, two workshops two days one only with uh, with the potential users and we had from this company to uh, the project owner as well as the technician sitting and listening to them and what those people were clearly saying is 
we're not interested. We don't need it. So now they were super depressed. Mm. And the second day, we just brought it and said, if you want to build this, guess what? Your customers don't need it. Yeah? And it was a little bit strange uh, because they were very kind of disappointed. But in the end, they also said, really, thank you. Because typically it would be, great, you want to spend money? Well, do yeah. it. Yeah? I think that the responsibility as a consultant, if you see the building something no one wants to have, just tell them it makes no sense. Mm. And that's what I think most of companies who don't do, let's say, design thinking or any sort of discovery, even let's say Google's design sprints, mm. you know, which is all the craze right now, um, who try to go as cheap as possible and not investing a day or two doing design thinking workshop. And they spend months developing something. Mm. And when in the end realize that that just doesn't get, get traction and they start to patch, patch, patch. That's also an idea from the poster. So when you have the poster, you can actually drag people in the room and I always recommend it. Go and find an end user and just tell them what you discovered in the workshop. Like I had a workshop and they were trying to build a new parking app so to utilize parking space. And I was asking them like, what's your value proposition? Well, we're gonna use blockchain. And my question was, do you think the end user really cares? Yes, it's fantastic. And then the question was, well, how many people would actually be interested? Everyone who has a car. Mm -hmm. But it was clear that there was no real benefit. So I said, great. You have 15 minutes time, go out, drag anyone in. I don't care. You said everyone who has a car is interested. I want at least one person who's going to come back and say, this is cool. Mm -hmm. So they came back after 15 minutes and they had no one. Yeah? So I think it's important as early as possible to get end users involved, but you can even use a poster. You don't have to develop anything. Just tell mm -hmm. them the story. Yeah? Imagine you have this app, you're sitting on the subway, you're doing this and that. Mm -hmm. Would you use it? And people are super honest because as long as it's just ugly sketches, it's no stupid idea. The moment you build a beautiful prototype, it's like, oh, we invested so much time to make it nice. How can I tell them that it's a like, really uh, mm -hmm. stupid idea? Yeah, or, or you could just do prototype, as in spend a day coming up with something clickable or just wireframe sketches and then validate the same way. I think for validating, the more ugly it is, the better it is, because it's like, okay, this looks nice, could you improve this or that? Mm -hmm. um, but if it's the idea really makes no sense, they're going to say, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, I guess, the story as well. It's only the story, because I think only the story... Uh, People can only follow stories. You can't follow mm. like functions. It's a cool function. Uh, I don't know. I'll have a flying self-replenishing icebox. So what's the point? Ah, my story is when I walk to work and it's hot and uh, I'm going to have a drone and it's going to drag the icebox behind me and any time I want to have a cold beverage, I'm just going to grab to the back and mm. take it. Most people are going to say maybe you want to just have a knapsack with with a cooling box and that's mm. going to be sufficient so if you have a story then you can link like are there some logical components while if you just say do you want to have a flying ice box no but if you frame it in a story it's much easier for people actually to check if it makes sense so you mentioned that kind of in the workshops you usually have you work, work with a product champion or like somebody from product that is the workshop owner. So do you also try to involve someone from development? That's hard to say. As I said, every workshop is always designed for a specific instance and it depends on which part of the project you are. What I usually try to do is have, let's say, uh, a vertical cut through the organization. That means I want to have some person who can make a decision, potentially. Mm -hmm. I want to have one or two people that have the sanity hat on from technology. I want to have some business owners that look about what's the value for the business. And I want to have some end users. I try to have the complete spectrum, but often it's not like you can choose. It's That's also part of setting up the workshop is I like to have a list where I have all the participants. And the question to the workshop owner is, why are you inviting him mm -hmm. or this person? And what is he going to contribute? Like, for example, you have a workshop, let's build a new 
online shop, but there's no one for marketing. Then I'm going to raise my hand and say, I guess mm. before you're going to go on, and <laughs> someone for marketing is going to check it. So yeah. uh, let's have it in the workshop, but then maybe the feedback is they're not available. Also, okay, but then inform this person. We're going to have at least invite the person. Mm. If they say no, it's also okay. But it's not like you're bypassing them. And when it comes to technicians, it depends if it's a very technical workshop, which is also okay. Maybe we want to solve a technical problem, then I will have the uh, technology persons in the room. But in general, I always try to have the end users so you can use the application. Mm. Yeah, it's the same for me at least. Uh, so I usually involve, let's say, if it's data science related thing or it's something to do with machine learning, it wouldn't make sense to drive it just purely with marketing people or end user. You would want someone who actually has done it or knows what's what's the limit basically because they are going to have to implement if we figure out what it is. And in the end, if it's a flying car yes. and we cannot make it happen, you're going to suffer basically. What about, let's say, startups and smaller sized companies, even let's say mid-sized companies, if I would try to get design thinking there might be a bit of a pushback mm -hmm. because everyone is in that rut to do it like very lean. I think one of the values from having a workshop and a moderator in the room in the first place is having an external uh, person, an external person who does not understand anything about the business. So I'm helping a startup in Austria to they want to found a new school. So we had a workshop last Saturday. The feedback was, it's nice to have someone external to actually ground us because they have all kinds of crazy ideas, fantastic ideas, how they're mm -hmm. going to change or build a new school. What they need is someone from outside. And the only thing that you're doing is in the workshop, you're kind of always asking them why, explain it to me. Like, because they're spending all of this time in a group. It's a small group, so they have a great idea and the next one has an like, they're kind of moving off in a space which is like almost fictional mm -hmm. and they need someone to ground them and to pull it back mm -hmm. and so even for a, for a startup the value would be explain it in basic terms so let's say the benefit for me i work in many different industries i might work with a bank do i have the background of the banking industry no tomorrow i work with a manufacturer of motorcycles mm -hmm. can i ride a motorcycle no but the task that you have in the workshop is to ask these very common questions, these like these no brainers. No one can ask in the room because everyone's gonna look at it and say, Why are you asking that? I mean, we're working since one year on this project and you have not even understood this basic thing. Mm -hmm. It's an outsider, and I always tell the people in the training is you need to realize as a moderator you're the dumbest person in the room when it comes to the domain. Yeah, mm -hmm. so all specialists, they're working 10, 15, 20 years, they have degrees in And it's science, okay whatever. to embrace it as well. Sometimes I just, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but sometimes I just say that. I say, I have no idea what you just said. Can you simplify for me or can you elaborate? And it's an easy car. Yes. People then let down their guard as well because we don't feel threatened by you, that you are, you know, know everything. And that also what you see often in the rooms, like you kind of notice, Actually, you're not the only person not understanding it, but you're the only person that has a good excuse to ask a question. But then you're sharing the knowledge in the complete room and you have everyone at the same level. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a very strong position. So even in a startup community where people are super agile and super creative, it can be very beneficial to have just an outsider step in and say, just explain it to me. In simple terms, because I guess those people are going home, speaking with their parents and friends, and they say, well, you're a geek. I don't get it. <laughs> so now they have yeah. this person who's not understanding in the workshop and confronting them and actually forcing them to explain it to me so I can understand mm. it. Would you recommend, Phil, then, let's say, for startups, small companies to get outsiders? Or always. Always? Yes. Why? Because it's so easy to... Let's say we're good friends, we're working on this fantastic idea, yeah, to kind of I tell you and you're you're excited and you tell me and I build on your idea and we have all these fantastic ideas. It's so easy to lose uh, uh contact with the real world. But 
that does not mean that if someone comes and you try to explain the idea and he says, I don't get it, does not mean your idea is mm -hmm. bad. But it should just let you take a step back and just ask, is the problem the person does not understand the vision I have or is it the way I'm communicating it? Mm -hmm. But clearly those are your potential customers in the future. So if I can't explain it to my mother, okay, maybe she's the wrong uh, age group, maybe she's mm -hmm. told, but if I can't explain it to, to my friends, uh, then maybe I have a problem. So I'm never saying, if you find no one who's going to understand it, it's wrong because maybe you're the only person who has this mm -hmm. vision, but at least it should give you like a stop, make a break and just check. Maybe you're not getting something. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely agree about that. Um, reaching out almost to external people to help out with design thinking, especially if, if companies don't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's also very interesting because some companies, very small, they have that culture of design thinking or they get someone like a new project manager or new product manager and they establish that as a process mm -hmm. and then it just works so smooth. So I think there is some chance that you could get it right as long as it becomes like almost like widely adopted. And I've seen some startups who do that and it's just amazing how we do it. Very good question is from one of the viewers again from Natalia and she's asking how to make sure that management understand why it is wrong if we don't include users in a process. Almost every manager has a, or knows of at least one project that really failed. Either he was responsible on him, for himself um, or has heard from it and the question is uh, are you sure? Are you sure that your uh, project is going to be successful? And one very good—it's like a safety belt—is having a person who can give you direct feedback. And when I see the people resist or don't want to have end users in the workshop, it's usually one thing they fear is that they're going to hear something they don't want to hear, and that's the end user telling them, "I don't need it." Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's no point in avoiding that because uh, you can either ask the end user very early in the stage, which is cheap, or you can build your application, spend one or two or five or ten million euros or pounds or whatever. They're still going to have the same answer. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, technicians have the illusion if it's just fantastic, everyone's going to use it. And there's a great example that that's not true. Many years ago, when the Segway came out, yeah? the inventor of Segway said, that's going to revolutionize the way uh, where people are going to commute in the future. Mm -hmm. In reality, uh, it was a spectacular technology, a piece of technology, but the only people using it today are tourists going in cities and they're paying for it. It's a joke. What actually was the real solution is like this really old uh, scooter the children already had with an electrical uh, battery and, mm. and, and to an uh, electric engine. Yeah? So sometimes technology, people just think if it's perfect, everyone's going to love it. But the truth is, and we see it from the same way, it's a great piece of technology, but actually totally useless. You can't mm. take it in a subway. It's much too expensive. <laughs> it's much too big. Yeah, so mm. the many things why a simple school is a much, much better solution. And it's surprising that they're still going. So I don't know if I, I've seen at least a few months back where they're making individual wheels for each leg. Mm -hmm. And it's just so there is still that hammering of, you know, trying to make innovation happen for innovation's sake. But it doesn't seem meaningful because I haven't seen segways in forever. Well, they're, they're always going to have a market segment. But in mm -hmm. reality, if I walk out in any city, I see scooters, 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 scooters. Yeah, mm -hmm. because they just survived. Let's say the technology evolution that that makes much more sense for many, many reasons. And now a question which is basically going to take you a bit back, but. If you could go back, because you have so many years of experience running workshops and moderation, what would you be doing different? I think today I uh, may be a little bit more bold. In, um, in the beginning, I was not sure how, how, how can you really orchestrate conversation. Mm -hmm. I was often not sure if that's going to work out. But what maybe is different today is 
that I firmly believe that uh, what we are asking from, from product developers, go and ask the end user, I need to apply exactly the same for the workshop. And so mm -hmm. what I believe is working the workshop owners with the complete workshop before you do it, which people often don't like to do. It's like, if I show you exactly what you're going to get and you don't get it, you're going to be disappointed. So it's much mm -hmm. easier to say, we're going to have a workshop and we don't know what's going to come out. Fantastic mm -hmm. ideas. We're going to have a lot of post-its. Being very, not very concrete is like easy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But being so bold to say, I'm going to orchestrate a four days workshop. We're going to do exactly this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And have the confidence mm -hmm. that that works. Something I would not have been doing in the beginning. It was like kind of trial and error. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's going to work out. But, but do you imagine, like, what, what would be your advice for, let's say, junior? Let's say myself. It took me almost a decade to develop very thick skin where I can challenge stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I, I can push back and, and I can do it with no worries, let's mm -hmm. say. But to me, juniors, almost even senior designers, sometimes struggle with that. Like, what would be your, I don't know, what, what could be the training wheels for them to achieve that, you know, boldness or figure skin? I think also to be a moderator, you need a very specific kind of personality the one thing is you need to be able to cope with uh, frustration uh, you have to have very high frustration levels yeah mm -hmm. so if you start your workshop and the first thing is like why are we sitting here this is a waste of time yeah so you need to have some kind of answer you never may take it personally but I also think in the end for me designing or design thinking workshops is all about uh, it's common sense Mm -hmm. And I don't, I mean, the design thinking label is something to market it, but I think it's something that's rooted in the way human beings just act. And my example is uh, in the Stone Age, maybe there was a guy taking a stone and throwing it onto a mouse, and the mouse was dead. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so I can eat the mouse, but it's small, but maybe now we need to go to mammoths and we need a bigger stone. That's the whole thing that's happening in design thinking. Mm -hmm. You have an idea, you try it out, you might fail. And if it works, then you just uh, take it in, in, in larger scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you just need this openness and try it out, the willingness to fail. And some people want to be moderators. I've met people who desperately want to be moderators, but it won't happen. Mm -hmm. Like I can't be a singer. I won't be on stage. I won't be a football player. You can't do everything. So I think my advice for people that want to go into this space is, Try it out, be very open, be ready to fail. And if the feedback is, hey, that was nice, can we do more of it? You're on the right track. I found this quote from you, and, and that's probably from some time back, where you st stated that to be su a successful design thinking moderator, you need to be a master of managing uncertainty. So how do you do that? What I mean with that is, no matter how rigorously you plan your complete workshop, there can always be some surprises. Like I had one workshop where five people should have showed up, so one person showed up. And now, what could you do? You could call the end of the day. So my decision was now I'm going to have the workshop with the one person. Mm -hmm. So always expect things to happen, or you have a workshop and you plan a full day. After one hour, there's a fire alarm for whatever fire sprinkler went off. And you just lose an hour. Yeah? So you should never be surprised to uh, expect something unusual is going to happen. Well, it's no big deal. Yeah? Just You lose this hour, mm -hmm. just reframe it. and Improvise. Improvise. Yeah. And, and also that can be fun. Yeah? Last question before we wrap up. Um, where do you think the design thinking is headed? That's a hard question. So... Um, Many people kind of, what I always see, there's like cycles. People say design thinking is great and design thinking is bad. And you have fractions. Is this this kind of design thinking or that kind of design thinking? And people say, maybe we have to change it to design doing or, mm -hmm. or different name. I think all that does not solve the problem because, as I said, I think design thinking is something rooted into the way human brains work or how humans uh, interact. I don't think design thinking is going to change uh, per se because it's just 
a different kind of a conversation and it's common sense. Mm. Maybe what's going to change is the artifacts that we're going to use. Maybe that in 10 years we're going to have design thinking workshops instead of writing post-its. I'm going to write on my mobile phone. I'm going to click and it's going to be on the wall. Uh, technically, things might change. Uh, mm. But I think it's so basic, a uh, basic way of communicating, of solving problem. And I don't think it's anything spectacular for the 19th to 20th century. I'm convinced they did it millions of years ago. And that's the reason why we're not sitting on trees and why we're not living in caves is because our natural ability to have an idea, to test it, to evolve it, to build on that idea and to pass it on to the next generation that this is an insight we have. So Sean, uh, where can people find more about you? Well, I have a LinkedIn Billboard Design Thinking group. So Billboard Design Thinking on LinkedIn, you can join the group. I share everything for free just because I think we need more moderators in the world. Mm. There's so many projects where we would need good moderators and uh, please just copy everything, use it, be successful, make a business on it, get rich, I don't care. <laughs> Just use it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah.